all, this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. We have a special show for you today, 9 a.m. in the morning. We have Dr. Paul Marek with us. I don't think that Dr. Paul Marek now needs any more um, introductions. I think now we are known as cool beans who are associated with Dr. Paul Marek as well. So he is here today. Uh, his contributions are actually seen on FLCCC, I think, in the US. And then from here, worldwide, the management approach, the very first all-encompassing multifaceted management approach was actually presented by Dr. Paul Merrick. And now there are branches of that and there are expansions of that. So Dr. Paul Merrick, thank you very much for giving your time and for being with us. Thank you, Dr. King Bean. So uh, the uh, it is such a great honor to have you. And especially nowadays, as there is a there is COVID and there are variants and there are changes in symptoms, plus there is vaccines. And then there are rumors and myths and some truth and some less truth that this would happen and that would happen. Then on top of this long COVID and then the post vaccine symptoms, there is a there is a huge mess at this time that is out there. I want to start with what is your take on the current status, pathology, management approach, how physicians and patients should look at COVID after 15 months of the knowledge? Yeah, so that's a good question. And thanks for being here. So the first point I need to emphasize is COVID-19 is probably the most complicated disease we know about. It's exceedingly complicated. So, you know, I have a database of over 2,000 papers, which I've read, and I'm sure you've read thousands. And despite those papers, we know, we're learning new stuff every day. It's exceedingly complicated. Multiple pathways are involved. Um, so I think one has to be very skeptical of these so-called experts who, who think they understand the disease and sprout forth all these words of advice when they really don't understand the disease. And I think there's a fundamental concept. You need to understand the disease to treat the disease. Unless you really understand it, you cannot give advice. And it's very complicated. There are multiple pathways involved. And I think, you know, every day we learn new pathways and new molecules and new pathogenetic pathways. Um, we currently have a paper under review on the pathogenesis of COVID-19. It's very complicated and there are multiple pathways. But I think what has become evident is that the macrophage and the monocyte play a key role in this disease, both in acute COVID, in post-COVID, and probably in the vaccination syndrome, so that this is an inflammatory disease. However, you know, we've gone through the stages of the disease, and despite having gone through this multiple, multiple times, folks still don't get the idea. You have the symptomatic phase characterized by viral replication. Viral replication ends after about 10 days of symptoms in most patients. You then go into the inflammatory phase. This is a profound inflammatory disease. Profound. And you have to deal with the inflammation the clotting, the platelet aggregation. Otherwise, patients will not get better. And there's no single magic bullet. I think this is just so Im important. There are people who are obsessed by one or other treatment pathway. That's completely false. There are multiple pathways. It's a complicated disease, and you need to attack it on multiple fronts. I'll give you sepsis as an example, septic shock. So patients who are in septic shock, you wouldn't just give them norepinephrine. That would be medical negligence. You give them a whole host of therapeutic interventions whose goal is to restore physiological balance. That's what you want to do. Multiple drugs working differently and synergistically to restore homeostasis. And COVID is no different. Um, so that's really my overview. It's a very complicated disease. We learn more and more every day, and one has to keep an open mind. You know, these people who, who have their favorite, you know, dogma, they hold on to it like it's a religion. 
And they don't keep an open mind. You have to have an open mind, you know, because it's changing and you cannot just hold on to your religious dogma. We should be led by the best scientific evidence. I totally agree with, with that. So I have a question here. This is my question. Uh, and it has been in my mind for, for a very long time. And that is your own team and their work keeps getting censored here and there. And somebody would come in Facebook or YouTube or somebody else, Twitter, and they would say, you know what, we don't agree with what you're saying and they'll censor it. At the same time, there are some folks and their messages that I feel are not correct. Do I'll give you an example. For example, there is a um, message out there which is taken as fact by many. And that is that if a vaccine is given, somehow the innate immune arm is destroyed. And now the person does not have an innate arm to work with. And when they would get the actual infection, their innate arm will become outcompeted by the adaptive arm. And all of a sudden, they'll get a huge disaster at their hand and possibly die. When we look at the current pathologies after 15 months, and when we talk about, when you talk about multiple facets of this disease, how do somebody figure out what works, what is to be included, and what cannot be included? What is the, what is that criteria? How do we find that out? Yeah, so you know, I think science is not perfect. It's self-correcting and self-regulating but it's based on discussion and exchange of information. And I think what's happening is we're being censored. The goal is to censor those people that are wacky and really come up with outrageous treatment protocols. But by silencing everybody, they have basically terminated scientific dialogue. We've, we, have no, we have no exchange of information. And I think that's a really bad thing. So even though there are people out there that have really bizarre ideas, let them speak their, their work mind, because I think the scientific truth will come out. The science will prevail. The truth will prevail. And I think everybody should have their voice. And we could talk about it in a scientific way, not personally attacking people, but we look at the science. So there's no question the censorship and lack of transparency has been has been one of the worst parts of this pandemic. We have both misinformation and disinformation, which is deliberate because physicians are not being told the truth. Patients aren't being told the truth. The public's not being told the truth. I think that they're smart enough to realize, let them weigh up the evidence themselves. You know, that's what, that's how, what science is based on. You know, Absolutely. even if it's something that I don't disagree with or agree with, I'll say, well, publish it. Because you know what? There needs to be different and cons this is the dissenting points of view. And they will come to the truth. And by censoring everything has had a terrible impact. And, you know, I think clinicians don't know what to do. They're confused. And if they're confused, you can bet that patients are confused and the public's confused. So nobody really has a good handle on what's going on. Absolutely correct. And I totally agree with this. Um, I was uh, interviewed by a journalist, which I'm sure that you are uh, much more in the news and these discussions. I was interviewed by a journalist who said, there are views that you don't agree with. And I said, yes. And she said, do you think that they should not be able to make their point or have their discussions out? She, she was trying to figure out what does censorship mean to me? And I said exactly the same thing that let them have their point of view as well. This is not necessary that I'm debating them or this is not necessary that I am going and correcting them. But the truth, as you said, will prevail. We'll find out what the truth is and how to manage. Uh, on the same note, how do you keep helping? So I want to go to the long, long COVID. I want to look a little deeper in the pathology as well. But this is a this is a bigger problem at this time. And I want to uh, poke a little more of this topic with you. Uh, how do you live through this time of censorship? Because what I think is it's not just the current dialogue is blocked. And so the flow of information is blocked and possibly helping of the people is blocked. But also for the future, 
when a journalism student is going to look back at this time of the society and say, what were these people doing when the COVID occurred? They would not find our messages because these would have been censored and cleaned out. So they would not know that there was a do Dr. Paul Marek who was talking about, hey, let's use this or let's use that or Dr. Corey who was saying this because most of that would have been scrubbed. So how damaging is this erasure of the fingerprint of the current work for future as well? So what's, what we're going through now is unprecedented in the history of science. I mean, this goes back to witchcraft and really prehistoric behaviors. I mean, science is based on exchange of information and that has been censored. So I think history is going to look back very unfavorably on this period. I think this is a very dark period in the history of humanity, the history of science, the history of the press, you know, the history of freedom of speech, just because of the complete lack of information, misinformation, disinformation, and censorship. I mean, it's absurd. You know, it's absurd. We, what we're saying is being censored and labeled as scientific misinformation. Yet the CDC and the NIH and the WHO are given you know, unlimited access to, and they can say what they want to. And because it's coming from them, it's so-called the truth, which often it is not the truth. We just have to have to look at the scandal of the lab leak theory just to realize what a scandal it's been. And that misinformation and disinformation and lack of transparency is extremely harmful. Totally agreed. And just one more point, and then we'll continue with our next topics. This morning, <laughs> so it is an unfortunate habit of mine that I wake up in the morning and I look at my phone and messages. And just this morning, I had somebody send me a death threat for talking about masks, just masks. Me saying yesterday in the talk that I am comfortable with mask. And just for that, sending me a death threat and the uh, the graphic scenario that that person put together that this is how I should be killed was it was just baffling for me to see that not only this is a trend in the bigger media and other houses, but it has trickled down to people as well who don't realize what's going on and are just happy to take part in these kind of messages. Uh, so I'm going to continue. The discussion now from pathology point of view, one thing I wanted to sort out. There is, There are many folks now that say this is a vascular disease. It is a disease of the endothelium of the blood vessels causing vasculitis, which then turns into all other issues or causes all other issues. And then there is, as you were discussing, uh, inflammation and overwhelming inflammation. Are these two separate things and one or the other, or are they combined? Can you sort it out for us? Yes, that's a really good question. As I said, the pathology is really complex and there are multiple facets. It's not just monocyte and macrophage inflammation. We do get a profound inflammatory response with activated macrophages. But at the same time, we get a vasculitis probably complement mediated vasculitis, endothelial damage, activation of clotting. So they concur, occur together and concurrently. It's not one or the other. And that's just part of the syndrome. You know, we get production of autoantibodies. We get ACE2 deficiency. We possibly get mast cell activation. Um, we get T cell dysfunction. It's a very complicated disease. And it's not just one pathway. I think the, the probable, the core is excess inflammation with macrophage activation together with, together with an endotheliitis and vasculitis. And what is truly fascinating is this vasculitis really targets the pulmonary bed and the brain. And it may be related to the high expression of ACE2 in the endothelium of those organs. So, it's absurd just to focus on one or the other. It's a complex disease which is multifaceted and multifactorial. And the inference is 
to treat this disease, you've got to treat all the components of the disease. You know, if you just treat the inflammation and you forget about the clotting, you, you're missing half the story. So it has to be an all-encompassing understanding of the disease and treatment of the disease. Totally understood. So I am going to request you to sort out one more point for me. And for the cool beans, there are tons of us here listening to you right now. Uh, the cardiac damage that is occurring, of course, COVID causes it. Nowadays, we are seeing it with vaccines as well. Have you uh, gotten some uh, papers or researches or read or have a conjecture of your own? Is it the spike protein built by the vaccine going in the blood, attacking the heart? Or is it the antibodies being produced and causing an cross-reaction with the cardiac tissue? What are the possibilities there? So that's a good question. So, you know, if you look at COVID per se, it doesn't target the heart directly. So having myocardial damage or inflammation is not the primary pathology, but I think the heart gets involved as a bystander. And I think due to a number of mechanisms, you know, just overwhelming inflammation, we get abnormalities of energy metabolism and mitochondrial function. So, you know, obviously the heart is a highly bioenergetic organ. We get reactive oxygen species. We have cytokines. This damages cardiac mitochondrial function, much like in sepsis. So the heart really is involved as a bystander. Then obviously is the question of autoantibodies. So the spike protein is a, it's a toxic thing. And it results in the production because of molecular mimicry of autoantibodies. And these antibodies react against a whole host of organs. It's truly astonishing. So, I mean, if you look at antiphospholipid antibodies, so these are antibodies against phospholipids which activate clotting. One study showed that 50% of patients with COVID have antiphospholipid antibodies. It's truly astonishing. And then we have antibodies against platelets. We have antibodies against pancreatic tissue. We have anti-brain antibodies. So it's endless. So because of this molecular mimicry problem, we get production of autoantibodies. Now, how this all plays into the heart is somewhat complicated. I, I think that the heart is not a direct target. So the lung is a direct target. I think the brain vasculature is a direct target. I think the heart is involved just because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a highly bioenergetic organ and is a passenger in this terrible process. Got it. I totally agree with you. I had been talking about um, uh, antibody, uh, the mimicry and the antibody or cytokine or just the workload issues with the heart and those causing the issues instead of the the COVID or the spike proteins just going to the heart and attacking it. A uh, couple of questions which totally up to you to pass on them. These no, are I can, questions. I can answer anything. I'm open to okay. anything. Okay, cool. So one question. There has been a lot of discussion. You touched upon that as well, the lab leak theory. Do you suspect that this may be a manipulated virus? This may be an experiment that went bad. Yeah. So, you know, one has to look at the preponderance of evidence. So, you know, most things in science is not absolutely clear cut, much like a jury. They weigh the evidence, you know, and you look at the preponderance of evidence. You know, there's never a golden, you know, bullet. And I think the preponderance of evidence highly suggests this was a manipulated virus that whether it leaked on accident or by design, leaked from the Wuhan laboratory. I think the overwhelming evidence, you know, the original thought was that there was an intermediate host and that spread from, an inter from a bat to an intermediate host to man. We're 15 months down and they have never, ever, ever isolated an intermediate host. There was an intermediate host with SARS and MERS. One has never been found. And the molecular structure of the spike protein would suggest that this was a manipulated, the protein was specifically manipulated and enhanced. And then obviously there's the question of these healthcare, these 
workers in the lab who got sick, you know, in early November last year. And obviously there's Dr. Fauci's leaked emails. So, you know, I think if you weigh the evidence impartially, objectively, you have to say that the likely source of this virus was the Wuhan Institute of Technology. I mean, you know, where did the virus start? In Wuhan. I mean, so it wasn't an accident. Uh, I So for the first time, I'm going to reveal how I felt as well. I keep using this term for a long time. The, the diversity of the symptoms and the systems it involves and the depth of damage it does and the durability of the damage, that first it causes the acute and then it becomes long COVID and then it just keeps sitting with us. The, this... I have not seen any other virus in my lifetime which does this kind of destruction. And of course, that is why we have a pandemic. I have not seen a pandemic before. Uh, one more question. Similarly, a question that is myth, rumor, uh, conspiracy, but important. Are variants going to... Are be, they are because we are vaccinating people. So how, how about a backup for a second? What is your opinion about vaccines? good thing, bad thing, selectively good, selectively bad? Where is your uh, head at for vaccines? Oh. So that, that is such a difficult question. Um, so, you know, what I can tell you is I think that the vaccines are somewhat effective in decreasing cases of COVID, hospitalization, and death. But I think we can say categorically and without question, this is these are the most dangerous vaccines that we've ever used. The number of side effects and deaths from these vaccines, and this is based on reportable data from the WHO and the VARS network, the number of deaths and adverse events are for order of 10 to 100 fold magnitude than any other vaccine. So one has to weigh the risks and benefits. You know, like most things in medicine, it's not simple. You have to weigh the risks of the vaccine versus the benefits. And, you know, when people ask me, should I get vaccinated? You know, I say, I can't tell you. It's a decision you have to make, but it should be based on your risk of dying from COVID versus your risk of dying from the vaccine. And it also depends on your risk aversion, your philosophy, and it can't be seen as a in a vacuum. So if you decide not to be vaccinated, I think you need to still be socially responsible. You need to, you know, wear masks and do whatever you need to do to prevent getting COVID and spreading COVID. Um, certainly, you know, this is the biggest experiment done in the history of mankind. You know, we've never used vaccines like this before. We don't know what they do. We don't know their long-term effects. And to make it even worse, the vaccine companies know a lot about these vaccines, but they, they haven't given us this information. It's hidden. They're hiding the information from us. So, for example, when you get the mRNA vaccine, you know, people assume it stayed in the arm, but that's not true. It does, the spike tends to spread throughout the body. Now, the, the, the vaccine companies know about this, but they don't want to tell us about it. We have to figure this out ourselves. So it's much better to be open and transparent because, as I said, the truth will come out. So, you know, the, the question of vaccines is a very difficult one. And, you know, we get asked, you know, my son's going to college and the college is forcing him to be vaccinated. I don't want him to be vaccinated. What do I do? So I think that's a terrible situation that, We've put pe people in, in this in our community and in, in, in the world. Then it's it's an awful dilemma that they're facing. And and uh, thank you very much for this comment. Um, I actually had been a little frustrated with CDC, quite frustrated. The uh, vaccine, cardiac damage, younger patients. CDC knew from their own reporting. So I'm talking on the record. They knew that. 9% of the population that is being vaccinated is youngsters from age 12 and I think up to 24. However, 53% of the cases of the um, cardiac issues are occurring in this 9% population. 
they knew this. And then on June 10th was the uh, meeting to discuss what to do. And they simply said, you know what, there is, we're going to observe this holiday. And then they came in the week later and they simply said, risk benefit analysis allows us to say, continue to use the vaccine. I thought they would have come back and they said, slow down for the 12 to 24, only administer it to those who may be at an additional risk. For example, let's say they are type one diabetic or they have cancer or immunosuppression or something else. What is your take on this? Should there yeah. be messages out there to say this group don't do this? So, you know, the vaccine companies have been indemnified by the federal government against lawsuits. So you can take a vaccine and it can kill you and you cannot sue the vaccine company. So they give given carte blanche to really do whatever they want to. It's unprecedented. It's completely unprecedented. They're protected against liability if they produce a dangerous vaccine. And I think the you have to look at the risks of dying of COVID. If you below the age of 40, your risk of dying of COVID, unless you have the comorbidities you talk about, diabetes or severe obesity is really low. So you've got to do a risk benefit analysis. And I believe that people who are below the age of 30 who have no risk factors are more likely to develop adverse effects from the vaccine than they are to develop complications from COVID. And I think people, you know, we need to respect their autonomy. We need to expect to respect their informed consent. They should be able to decide for themselves. You know, we should not be forcing this upon people. And this mandate that colleges and some hospitals have, I think, is it goes against the foundation of freedom of choice, freedom to do to your own body as you respect, and freedom of consent. You know, we're forcing, we're not giving people true informed consent. And I think people should be able to decide for themselves. That's not to say people shouldn't be irresponsible. You know, we need to we need to realize this is a really bad disease. There's a lot of inf misinformation about that. This is a bad disease. It kills people. You just need to go to an ICU to see it. It kills people. So this is a serious disease, but it requires serious contemplation, serious thought, and a really thoughtful strategy. Got it. So one more follow up question. This is also a very common one. I'll give you my take on it so that um, I am clear for you know where I stand. Uh, vaccine after recovering from an infection. My take has been if somebody is healthy, they recovered correctly and their body is in a correct state, their immune system is fine. They did not develop cancers or leukemias or diabetes or something else or the variant has not changed into SARS-CoV-3, then for two, three years of time, there is no need for a vaccine. There is no need to take that extra risk. How do you see it? Yes, I mean, you know, a natural infection is is the best form of immunity because you, you're not just responding to the spike protein, you're responding to the body's responding to all the antigens associated with this virus, you, your T cells, your B cells, uh, you, you develop a robust immune response. And it doesn't make any sense to force people to be vaccinated who've previously had COVID. Now, obviously, you know, as variants come across, things may change. Um, but you know what? I think, you know, that this, 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 uh, approach of vaccinating everyone who's had COVID regardless of their risk factors is not a thoughtful, logical, common sense approach. Totally agreed. So um, I, I think that this we all can then agree on. For example, women 50 years and younger, if they take adenovirus based vaccines, they can develop clotting. And we don't have a solution for that, but we have a solution to say, maybe take another vaccine or maybe you don't need a vaccine yet. Why is CDC's, WHO's, NIH, FDA, why are they not able to come up with a one page guideline to say, 
if this is your comorbidity, then please do take the vaccine. And if you're woman and this is your age, then don't take this and take this. And if you're a boy or 30 years and younger, why is that guidance not available? Is it very difficult? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And you ask a really important question. I think part of it is this fantasy of reaching herd immunity, that we have to do everything possible to reach herd immunity, which we'll never achieve. I think we just have to be honest. That's a fantasy which will never be achieved because you would have to, 70% of the entire population, that includes young people, would have to be immune. That's never going to happen. So that's the first thing is there's this complete obsession with achieving herd immunity. Secondly, the vaccine companies now have unprecedented power, unprecedented power and influence. And there's no question that big pharma, as well as the governments that support them, control the WHO, the NIH, the CDC, you name it. So we're not given the truth. The, 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 the goal is to just ram the vaccine into many as many arms as you can, regardless. And obviously, that's not a sound and scientific approach. Um, we need to be much more thoughtful. And I think the, the CDC and the FDA and whoever need to be honest and put out, you know, scientific guidelines and, and give people the choice, give them the option, give them the information, don't hide the information. There's an enormous amount of disinformation. So providing false information to try and get people to be vaccinated. And I think if you provided the truth, people would be much more open to, you know, a dialogue and to do what's best for them. I totally agree with you. Uh, I thought this is what would happen in the U.S. at least. And I'm totally wrong. Actually, other countries have done better now. Uh, I thought that over here, we will have weekly uh, debriefs and we will have stalls and we would have uh, tables at, at the street corners and there will be weekly debriefs to say, hey, with the vaccines, we are seeing following side effects. We're seeing this kind of a cohort, which is getting more issues than not. And so do this and don't do this. That missing leadership is causing mushrooming of the disinformation and misinformation because the actual truth is not available even if it looks bad it is not available yeah so you know what you say is there is this truth vacuum there is a treatment vacuum there is a scientific vacuum and this starts back to march of last year there's there's been a complete failure of the major medical institutions across the world across the world Every major society has failed in it to provide honest, useful scientific information. If you remember the approach of the WHO, the CDC, the NIH, and then the SCCM and ATS and IDSA was there's no treatment. It's symptomatic care. Just treat their fever, give them fluids. You've got to be kidding. We knew then this was a profound inflammatory clotting disease. So that's why, you know, us, the FLCC, we, we filled this void starting at the beginning because we knew you, we needed to put out useful information. And I think to this day, the CDC, the NIH, the WHO has failed. You know, there were these ridiculous briefings from the White House, but there was never actually anyone who, who knew how to treat this disease. They never had a treating clinician say, this is COVID. This is what COVID does. These are the symptoms. This is what you have to do. The NIH is completely silent on the treatment of early patients who have symptoms. So the early symptomatic patient, their, their treatment algorithm to this day is stay at home until you become cyanotic and stop breathing. You stay at home until you become cyanotic and stop breathing and go to the ED. That is what the federal government is telling people to do. It's an outrage. And obviously, the rest of the world follows the US because we are the so-called scientific leaders. And I think that is an outrage. You know, while we may not have the best answers, we do have some answers. And to tell people to stay at home, isolate, and 
till they go blue is an absurdity that's actually causing lots of damage because we are now waiting for the virus to in some people cause the cytokine storm and when they arrive with that state it is very difficult to reverse it and stop it and bring them back so i think a lot of damage is being done um, there's a comment here which i want to talk about and this is something i've discussed before as well the comment dan is saying flccc should re replace who and cdc in my opinion so i'm going to give my opinion and once again um, uh, flccc is really the management i want to quickly show the viewers the site as well and i'm sure they they know it but anyone who is new uh, this is the site this is dr paul marek his teams their work and over here there are protocols there is prophylaxis protocol there is prevention hospital home treatment hospital treatment long covid treatment treatment guidelines guidelines for doctors and so on in my opinion what would happen is and i think flccc has started that seed what will happen is i don't think who will be torn down or cdc will be torn down these are just too big and too embedded in the system organizations that cannot be taken away however organizations like flccc they will become the conscience of the medical sciences they will start showing the mirror to say here cdc says you sit at home till you become blue and here is actually you should be doing prophylaxis and here is the management you would do so these things would become that pressure that would allow the healthcare system to start getting on the right track am i correct in my assessment yeah so absolutely correct you know I, I couldn't agree with you more you know there are some people who think that we should take down the who or take down the cdc you know what i think that's an impossibility it's like saying oh let's start a new united nations that's not going to work. What I think we need to do is, you know, what we're doing, providing the best scientific data we have, we're starting a grounds, grounds root movement, and hopefully the WHO, the CDC, the NIH will listen to us. You know, they can only be deaf and dumb for so many months, and eventually the people are going to talk, and they're going to have to hear what we're doing and what we're saying, and it's a collective us. It's not just me and Dr. Corey. It's a collective us. And it's science that is talking. And I think they're going to have to listen. And I think we're also going to have to get to the root of the problem is what is driving this misinformation. And I think without any hesitation, the economic and financial motivations that are driving this. So profiteering has come at the expense of human lives. So it's a really astonishing thing to say that and a reflection of the world we live in. But making money and profiteering is what is driving this, not saving lives. And what they're most interested in is preserving that single organ which may be damaged the most, which is the back pocket. They're terrified of the back pocket being damaged. The heart, the brain, the lung, they don't care. It's the back pocket that's driving this makes sense so um if we uh, if we can now continue to the next set of topics one topic that is very near and dear to my heart I, i'm sure it is for you as well um for cool beans the long COVID, the pathology behind that this the management of it and then especially post vaccine long COVID like symptoms so of course not it is not covid it is post vaccine symptoms my question to you is do we know what is causing long covid is it one thing once again is it an endotheliitis is it mcas is it mast cell is it ma macrophages do we know what is happening and what is the right approach to manage it so you ask a really good question and a difficult one so there are no, numerous studies that have looked at the incidence and symptoms and risk factors of long COVID. The very few studies that have actually tried to dissect what is causing long COVID. So much like acute COVID, I suspect that there are multiple factors involved. It's not just one factor and one pathway. Uh, we know that you get 
vascular involvement in the brain. And I think you get microvascular thrombosis. So you get infarcts and neuroinflammation. So I think a percentage of patients have structural brain damage or inflammation from a vascular point of view. However, we now have, you know, as a result of the work of Bruce Patterson, really very good data showing that we have activated monocytes. So these are cells that produce inflammatory mediators and do not get turned off. So what seems to happen is the spike protein gets into these monocytes, activates the monocyte, which should normally not be long lived, but these monocytes continue to produce inflammatory mediators. So um, that seems to be a central core. And then I think also because of the immune dysregulation, you may get activation of dormant viruses such as EBV. So I think it's a conglomerate of things. I think some patients may have more of um, one pathophysiological pathway than another, but I think it's probably a combination. So you may have you know, EBV reactivation, you may have monocyte activation, you know, whether mass cells are involved, you know, it's a possibility. We don't really have a lot of good data about MCAS and mass cell activation syndrome. It's a possibility. But there's no question that this is a very bizarre disease. There's no disease like it. And the monocytes and macrophages get reprogrammed, probably by spike protein, and continue to produce inflammatory mediators. Um, so, you know, much like acute COVID, you know, as our understanding of, of the long haulers improves, it gives us a number of different therapeutic options based on our understanding of the disease. And it's a very real disease and people are debilitated. And what's interesting is that, you know, many young people who were not hospitalized, who had mild disease are developing long COVID. So it's not just the sick people and it seems to be across the age spectrum um, so it involves young people and old people so the um, economic and social and personal costs of, of the long haul are enormous so if i can then combine it with the vaccine as well how are you seeing the pathologies and the symptoms for example from covid it seems like older age folks are more affected by covid and it seems like younger age are more affected by vaccines. Uh, is that, uh, you were discussing that as well. Is that something that you um, are seeing more? So I think that's correct. The problem is, is, you know, there's been misinformation. That kind of scientific data, which would be helpful, is being censored at multiple levels. So we really don't know the truth. Our impression is that that the post-vaccination syndrome and the post-vaccination adverse events are much more common in younger people. Um, that's our impression. There's not a lot of data. And if you talk to, you know, the experts about a post-vaccination syndrome, they have no idea what you're talking about because they don't want you to talk about it. It's politically not correct to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. So as far as I know, there are not any peer-reviewed publications on post-vaccination syndrome. But we know from patients that they develop symptoms almost identical to the long hauler. They develop severe symptoms, very much similar to the post-COVID syndrome. Yep. So, you know, people say, oh, it's in the head, they're making this up, it's a psychiatric disease, they're trying to gain some something out of this. I think it's a real disease. And I think if we, you know, study them, as I think Dr. Patterson has studied them, these people truly have monocyte activation, production of cytokines, much like the post-COVID syndrome. And I think it all goes back to the spike protein. So this spike protein is a toxic thing, particularly the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. It's 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 a it's a small molecule, but it's remarkably toxic. Makes sense. 
So uh, if you are OK, I'm going to ask some questions that Cool Beans have asked. So ready? Can you give us some more time? Sure. OK, so I'm going to start with uh, Twitter. There are questions on YouTube as well. And then there are some live questions, too. So I'm going to try to do as rapid fire as possible. So let's start from here. These are the Twitter questions. And once again, I'll continue to say thank you. There are so many comments I'm seeing right now that are where folks are saying that please convey our gratitude and our thanks to Dr. Myrick and his team for the work that you've done and for the for the management and the protocols that you have brought to us. So once again, thank you from all of us. So the question here, Mirjana Bradar says, for, from what I understand, mutations occur easier when infection rates are high. There is also the hypothesis that stronger mutations may arise through vaccinations. Could prophylaxis with ivermectin used be by a larger number of people also drive virus mutations? So that's a good question. So, you know, the origin of the mutations is not clear, but clearly the more, the higher the viral load, the more the virus spreads in the community, the more mutations you're going to have. And the, the, for example, the Delta mutation, which involves the furin cleavage site, is a particularly virulent form. It's highly contagious. It spreads rapidly. It reaches high viral counts and has a higher rate of hospitalization and death. And it seems it's a process of natural selection, much like any kind of mutation, that the virus is going to mutate it's going to select out a more virulent form. It seems that people who are immunocompromised based may be a source of many of these variants because they cannot clear the virus so that the virus re re replicates to enormously high levels and ongoing in these people. And they may be one of the source of these mutations, which then spread really quickly. I don't think vaccination is... Ha ha increases the risk of mutation. But clearly, if we had got this pandemic under control months and months ago, I think we would have had less mutations. It's kind of obvious. If we can get rid of the disease, we're going to have less mutants. But the fact that the disease is so widespread just provides an opportunity for ongoing mutations. And yes, if we had done widespread ivermectin prophylaxis, I'm sure we would have driven down SARS-CoV-2. We would have eliminated the risk of mutations. I think that's highly likely. And, you know, the question comes about, you know, about resistance to ivermectin. The answer is no. We have no evidence that any of the variants are resistant to ivermectin. And this goes to its the mechanism of action. So I think the problem we're facing now is we fail to control this pandemic. We had widespread dissemination of the virus. And much like bacteria who will mutate to more you know, drug-resistant forms, it's, this virus is going to mutate. And it's going to mutate to a form that is more virulent and can spread easier. And the failure of the health system to control this pandemic months ago I think has led to these enormous number of variants. Got it. And thank you very much for bringing up this point that ivermectin is not easy to defeat by this virus. I'm, I'm paraphrasing your message. And for the cool beans here, we know that the ivermectin's mechanism, lots of mechanisms, but just a few of them. If virus wants to escape ivermectin, it has to change its spike protein. It has to change its RDRP enzyme. It has to change its MPRO enzyme, its effect on importing alpha and beta, and its effect on nuclear factor kappa B. Virus has to do all of those changes to kind of escape the ivermectin. That actually, if virus does it, it's a dead virus. A virus with a bad RDRP cannot work. So uh, ivermectin is pretty safe uh, uh, for for to use for this virus. Now, Sarah Weisman says, why do only a small subset of vaccine recipients have remarkably similar long-lasting side effects, tinnitus, fatigue, vertigo? What do we have in common? Could dormant herpes virus be reactivated in some people, or is it just nerve inf inflammation or both? Yeah, so that's a remarkably good question. 
And we know we don't know the answer, but I would say that there are probably multiple factors. People's genetic makeup, I think, would play an important role uh, in in determining the these side effects, which, as you say, that they're pretty common. So I think the the most likely explanation why it affects some people rather than others is differences in genetic makeup and differences in response to the spike protein. I think the post-vaccine syndrome is due to an aberrant response to, to the spike protein. So clearly some people respond one way uh, and others another way. So we do know in post-COVID you can get reactivation of herpes viruses, particularly Epstein-Barr. You know, whether this happens with post-vaccination, we don't know, but clearly it's a possibility. And I think we need to look at all these facts. Got it. Thank you. Rick Arby says, what is your opinion on lasting natural immunity for someone who took ivermectin while sick with COVID? Will it dampen antibody creation or lessen overall immunity against future exposures? Yeah, so that is a good question. You know, we don't know or have all the data. I would suspect that if you had a natural infection and you took ivermectin, you still go to mount a T cell and a B cell response and make antibodies. So I think you should be protected. Um, obviously, it's a good question and um, we need more information. But I think the likelihood is that one would have natural immunity, much the same way as somebody who had an asymptomatic infection or a mild infection. So I don't suspect, or we don't have any data to suggest that uh, ivermectin interferes with natural immunity or response to, to the vaccine. Got it. Thank you very much. Laura says, what is Dr. Merrick's advice regarding vaccination of 12 to 17 year olds and also college age students. So many mandates in place now, if there is a way patients can mitigate their vaccine adverse events when forced to, is there, I think she meant, is there a way patients can mitigate their vaccine adverse events when forced to take vax? Yeah, so this is such a difficult question to answer. It's so politically charged. So I'm not sure if you know, there is a surgeon, an Indian surgeon in Canada who was, who was advocating against vaccinating 12 to 17 year olds. He was severely reprimanded by the Canadian College of Physicians and Surgeons and has been sanctioned just because he voiced his opinion that there should not be max, mass vaccination of children. And if so, kids or their parents should be given informed consent. So this is unfortunately a terrible political situation. You know, as I said before, I think that the risk of a bad outcome from COVID in a 12 to 17 year old is very low. And the risk of an adverse effect to the vaccine is probably much higher. So it doesn't make, it's just not common sense that you would force vaccination in such kids. Now, you know, I think it's a risk benefit ratio if they were a type one diabetic, if they were immunocompromised, if they were severely obese, you may want to reconsider. But a healthy 12 to 17 year old, in my opinion, and obviously it's my opinion, I would be hesitant in vaccinating these kids. The problem is it's become a mandate. So you either vaccinate it or you don't go to college. And I think it just is unfathomable and just defies any kind of logic. It just makes no sense. Agreed. And uh, on top of this, considering that now we know, for example, at least in the US, CDC knows that 9% of this population getting vaccinated is getting 53% of the cardiac issues. Then we should step back and think about that. And that should be the risk benefit should not just be that. All right. The risk is smaller. The number of people who would get it is small. The risk benefit should be a healthy child may not have such an impact of the virus. Why not we do the risk analysis for somebody who's diabetic, as Dr. Paul Marek was saying, or who has leukemias or cancers or immunosuppression or obesity, or the virus has changed to SARS-CoV-3 and we all need something now. So uh, 
thank you for this uh, response, Dr. Marek. Uh, Joe Masterson says, my first question, why did you do this to us? Why did you do this to, to us? I have no idea. Um, I'm going to continue. Jane says, how long can I take ivermectin as prophylactic? Yeah, so that is a good question and it's partly unknown. Although we do have studies showing that pretty long-term ivermectin is safe. You know, we have studies from Argentina. We have a group in France that are looking at continuous ivermectin um, dosing, uh, primarily to prevent malaria. So, you know, prior to COVID, people were working on chronic ivermectin um, to prevent malaria. And it, 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 strangely enough, the ivermectin kills the mosquito that bites you and not the parasite. So people were looking at long-term ivermectin administration to prevent malaria, and it seems pretty safe. So the best data we have is that you can take it for as long as you need to take it. Um, I think that's that's the bottom line. Got it. Thank you very much. Marijana brother says, if ivermectin was a person, how would it comment on all what is going on around it? And what would it potentially be different to get better into the game already back in 2020 with all experience gathered? Yeah, so if ivermectin was a person, it would say, what the heck is going on? What's happened to the humanity? You know what? I'm going to go to a different planet because I just don't like planet Earth. It seems the whole planet seems to have gone mad. So I'm just leaving. And... Uh, you know, I think that's what Ivermectin would do. And obviously, what we need to do is, I think, the truth, the scientific truth, because the truth will eventually emerge. As the truth has emerged from where the virus came from, all this data is going to come out. And I think a lot of people are going to have mud on their face because they were so dishonest. So I think the time is now. Just stop all the BS. Tell people the truth. Let them decide for themselves. And let people have an intellectual discussion. You know, we should stop all the censorship. Let people talk. You know, the exchange of information is how we've progressed, is what separates us from monkeys. But it seems like monkeys seem to be smarter than we are. Got it. Thank you very much. I think that I Ivermectin man would say, WTF dudes, and, and then fly away. Okay, so Melanie says, I'd love to ask Dr. Marek what he thinks of the role of liposomal vitamin C for patients in the acute phase of COVID for people at home. Does it? So th there is some more, but please. Yeah, please. So um, please, Melanie, ask the question because this is another example of profound misinformation. So there are people who are trying to sell liposomal vitamin C to profit. They're trying to sell liposomal vitamin C to profit. So we do have at least three to four pharmacological studies that I know about that have compared serum levels of liposomal vitamin C to regular vitamin C, and they are exactly the same. They are exactly the same. And if one understands how vitamin C is absorbed by the GI tract, you would, it would be an absurdity to postulate the role of liposomal vitamin C. It's a complete nonsense idea. So uh, there's no data that liposomal vitamin C is any different from regular vitamin C. So what I would say is just continue to take regular vitamin C. Alexa, stop. Sorry. So, you know, I can buy vitamin C from my store. Um, I think it's $3.99 for a bottle of 100 whereas liposomal vitamin C is like $25. So people are wasting their money. It's a scam. And I think we have to just face the scientific truth. And that, that's what the data suggests. Got it. So Jana Taylor says, uh, Dr. Paul Maddick, I'm one year since COVID-19 onset, took ivermectin four times. My inflammation will not go away. Any advice? Gut health poor thanks yeah so that is a really good question so as i said before you know some people will respond to a single course of ivermectin and everything goes away but there are many other people that don't because you're not targeting the entire process so we do have now we have the 
I recover protocol, which includes a whole bunch of other stuff. And ivermectin is part of it. But if patients don't respond, you know, we suggest corticosteroid therapy. And then what's very cool, go down a bit, is macrophage monocyte repolarization therapy. So this is very cool stuff. So what happens is the macrophage is programmed to make inflammatory mediators. We want to reprogram it so it stops making these mediators. And scientifically, there's really good data, vitamin C, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, statins, and melatonin reprogram the monocyte or the macrophage. So many, some patients will just respond to ivermectin. Others require, you know, a more aggressive approach. And then the, obviously there is the question of mast cell activation. You know, we're not, we're not sure what role mast cells have. But to be honest, I think by adding, you know, an H1 blocker or an H2 blocker to your regimen can't do any harm. So my advice would be if you haven't responded to, you know, just ivermectin alone, you need the full Monty. You need the whole protocol. And then those people who have, you know, fog, head fog, may have you know, difficulty with clarity of thought, may want to try fluvoxamine. So, you know, I think that the ivermectin is okay as a starting point, but if you failed one course, I think you need a much more aggressive approach to the long hauler. Got it. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important question. Jenna, thank you for asking. And Jenna has been a, a cool bean for, for a year as well. Uh, Martha says, I'm looking forward to hearing from Dr. Merrick. I emailed him my post-vax story and he responded immediately and said it sounded very similar to the COVID long haul stories he had had. I think that's just a comment. Uh, Tiago Silva says, why vitamin C on eye mask protocol is so low? Vitamin C by itself is capable of eliminating any infection if taken, taking to bowel intolerance and one is sick, the body is really tolerant to vitamin C up to 200 grams. Yeah, so, you know, this has been studied scientifically. There's a lot of, as we said, misinformation. So you, we have saturatable vitamin C uh, transport proteins in the gut. This has been well studied in the last 15 to 20 years. So more than 500 to 1,000 milligrams. After that dose, what happens is it's not absorbed. You just poop it out in the stool. So a dose of more than 500 to 1,000 milligrams, you do not get increased absorption. And this, this has been well studied. So people can argue this, but they just need to look at the science. We have specific transporters in the gut. So the only way to bypass the transporters is what we do in the hospital. We give it IV. So giving it intravenously bypasses the gut transporters, allowing you to get higher concentration. So those people that are taking massive amounts of vitamin C, they're basically crapping it out into the stool. It's not being absorbed. Got it. Thank you very much. And so um, Dr. Paul Maddox's bean title is soybean and emperor bean. So he has two titles. And soon he is going to have the best human bean as well. Uh, Dr. Yo, who is a friend of mine, He's part of Dr. Bruce Patterson's uh, uh, team as well. Dr. Yo asked this question, what is Dr. Maddox's spirit animal? Yeah, so, you know, I think dogs, I'm a dog lover because I think they're the most kindest people on this planet. <laughs> and um, I sleep with a stuffed dog in my bed and my pet pug is my favorite person. They're kind, generous People. I think if the world was run by pugs and not by people, we would be in a much better place than we are now. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, if the government and media and corporate medicine have conspired to keep potentially life-saving treatments for COVID from the public, what other diseases have cures being obfuscated due to the power and greed, cancer, Alzheimer's, ALS, etc.? Yeah, so that's an absolutely good question. There's no question that pharmaceutical companies are interested in profits, not in cures. They're not interested in cures. They're interested in people selling people drugs, often that they don't need. And it is a terrible, it's a terrible reflection of the society that we live in. Um, 
And it's a good question. We just don't know. Got it. Uh, Farider AD says, start taking colchicine, 0.5 milligram BID for Mayo pericarditis prophylaxis after getting mRNA vaccine mentioned in recent CDC slides as part of recovery protocol for vaxxed induced heart inflammation. So I think they're asking, should, should I take colchicine 0.05 milligram for prophylaxis from vaccine side effects? Yeah, so that is a good question. And people ask, should we take ivermectin for prophylaxis or colchicine for prophylaxis or fluvoxamine? The answer is we really don't know. I think the risks are quite low. Um, so, you know, obviously colchicine would have a role in myocarditis or pericarditis, but you know, the absolute risk is quite low. So you'd have to treat a lot of people with colchicine for it to be effective. You know, what I would say is that those people who develop, you know, post-vaccine syndrome should start treatment really quickly. So, you know, once you start developing all these symptoms, then I think you need to initiate therapy, you know, whether it's colchicine or whether it's ivermectin or what it is. Um, you know, the question about what I should take to pr protect myself from the vaccine is a really good question, and we don't really have a good answer. Got it. Thank you. Tiago Silva says, does hydrogen peroxide nebulization help against COVID? Yeah, so I'm not for hydrogen peroxide nebulization. But indeed, you know, if you look on our protocol, there is this concept of oropharyngeal sanitization. So clearly the virus replicates to a really high concentration in the nasopharynx. So this very smart uh, uh, pharmacist from the UK came up with this plan of oropharyngeal colonization. And there are a whole thing, number of things you can use. You can use you know, chlorhexidine, you can use betadine, you can use aromatic oils. So it, it makes sense to to um, to use, there we go, nasopharyngeal sanitization. You can, you know, essential oils such as vapor wrap, uh, chlorhexidine, benzamine, mouthwash, betadine, nasal spray, which makes a lot of sense. There's a very good paper in the ENT journal showing that betadine is very effective in neutralizing the, vac the, the virus. So I think that's why you need a multiple approach to target this disease. So, you know, hydrogen peroxide, I would be a little bit careful of because it can be can damage tissue. But clearly, you know, the, this concept of nasopharyngeal sanitization, I think has a lot of merit. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, then Avox Mocha Bean says, I can't think of a smart question for Dr. Marek. I wonder, would you ask him a smart question, please, and tell him it was from me, <laughs> Mubin. So uh, this is really Mocha Bean trying to offload his work to me to ask you questions. So I will ask you two smart questions. One is, do you know why Mocha Bean is called Mocha Bean? Why AVOX is called Mocha Bean? See? Oh. I don't know. I would say he likes coffee. So so I think that there is a story you would love it. Avox's name was Coffee Bean. And then when Dr. Cody joined us, he had originally taken Poppy Bean. Then he said, I want to be a coffee bean. Now, Avox had the coffee bean. So we had to request Avox to, if he would graciously <laughs> donate his title to Dr. Cody, so Avox very generously and graciously gave coffee bean to Dr. Cody, and so he took up mocha bean. So that is one for the smart question. Second smart question, if you were to make a decision to say, I want to end pandemic in next one month, and let's say that the world would listen to you and we would do what you're saying, what will it be that you would say? Yeah, so I mean, this may sound a bit fanciful, but, you know, it has been done in India, it's been done in Mexico, it's been done in Chile. I would do a mass distribution program of ivermectin together with melatonin and aspirin, everybody. You know, we have to assume everyone's infected, and we, we should have done this months ago, just to get this pandemic under control. Just treat everybody, everybody. 
You know, uh, ivermectin is exceedingly cheap. It's exceedingly cheap. It's safe. Give it to everybody. That way we'll eliminate uh, SARS-CoV-2. We'll be gone. And I just don't understand why. Well, I do understand why we haven't done it, because there are economic and political factors that benefit from the ongoing pandemic. But if we had done a mass distribution of ivermectin together with likely melatonin, vitamin D, aspirin, I think we would get rid of this virus. Got it. Thank you very much. I think that that is the most important question and answer, actually. Uh, so I do not know how to pronounce this. Uh, Siu Dardano PY says, what is his position now regarding vitamin C and sepsis? Yeah, so that's such a good question. And there's been so much misinformation and disinformation regarding vitamin C. And there have been forces that have designed studies to fail. Let me say that again. There have been clinical trials designed to fail to invalidate the use of vitamin C. So yesterday, yesterday, a group from South Korea published a study looking at HAT therapy with vitamin C in the treatment of septic shock. And what they showed, they did what we have told people to do from the beginning. They looked at time to treatment. And if patients got vitamin C within two hours of developing septic shock, it had a remarkably beneficial effect on the outcome. After eight hours, it had minimal effect. We know in the vitamin study, well, we don't know, but we know the time to treatment was at least 16 hours, if not 20 hours. That was designed to fail. So I think if, we, if vitamin C is given early, as you would do anyone who's in septic shock, why would you wait? So I think it has a role. The study, I was delighted to see, they did what we've been saying for months, give it early. There's no benefit in giving it late. And indeed, I'm really excited to maybe tell people that the Belgian government has now sponsored a study in which they're looking at vitamin C in the emergency department. So this is an emergency department treatment. It's not something you give three days later. And in this randomized controlled trial, patients in the ED who septic will be given vitamin C. They have to be given it within six hours of presentation. So this is the C easy study. And, you know, I'm hopeful it will be positive and that will give us the answer. So while there are many people who think vitamin C is dead, you know, it's part of this overall dislike of cheap, effective drugs for the treatment of serious disease. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Johnson says, Dr. Paul Merrick, would these inactivated whole virus vaccine have the same problem, side effects, concerning spike proteins? So that's a really good question. So, you know, there are, most vaccines are either attenuated live vaccines or dead vaccine, you know, with antigenic components. So we don't know. It's a really good question where they're giving the whole, you know, whole protein antigen as an antigen would be less toxic. So what is really fascinating is, you know, I have, I have a group of colleagues at ODU that gave humanized mice, so you can make a mouse like a human, they gave the whole spike protein or just the S1 subfragment. They found that the whole spike protein was not toxic. It was the S1 subfragment. So which is truly really interesting. So um, it's a good question. We don't know. But I think it's particularly the, the sub S1 sub fragment of the spike protein, which is exceedingly toxic. Got it. Thank you. Um, William Goff says, with the birth of the UK and South African variants, the FLCCC bumped up the dosages needed for ivermectin. Does the Indian variant, Delta variant, require an even higher dose? Yeah, so th that's a good question. And... So we did bump up the dose, really not based on the variants, but there was some thinking that, uh, you know, based on the data from the disgraced Andrew Hill. So Andrew Hill was the disgraced WHO researcher, and his data tended to suggest that a 0.4 to 0.6 milligrams per kilogram was more effective than the 0.2. So this was really 
independent of the variance. So we do not think you need to increase the dose based on the fact that there's an increased percentage of the variance or the delta variant. So as we discussed before, we, we have no data that the delta variant is, is, is less susceptible to ivermectin than some of the um, earlier variants, but we don't really have good data. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Dan Solomon says, please ask him what he thinks about the principal study from Oxford on ivermectin. Did any of the they any of them reach out to FLCCC? Why are they enrolling individuals who may have been having COVID symptoms for up to 14 days? Is this study set up to failure? And here is the study's eligibility to join the trial within the first 14 days of experiencing COVID-19 symptoms or receiving a positive test. Yeah, thank you kindly for the question. Obviously, you've answered the question that you've posed. Is the study set up for failure? The answer is yes. And one has to under you have to question the moral and ethics of scientific researchers who are setting up a study that is destined to fail. It's unethical and it's immoral. So you're right, it makes no sense to have an inclusion criteria up to 14 days because by day 14, most people will have recovered. It's insane. We know that people who are symptomatic, that the most, the highest, the highest viral replication and the most infectious is the two to three days after symptoms. By the sixth day, by the sixth day, patients are no longer infectious. By the eighth day, they no longer have replicating virus. So to treat people with an antiviral up to 14 days is complete and utter insanity. And clearly it's much like the Brazilian study, which was designed to fail. If you enroll people who've already recovered, if you enroll people who've already recovered, you're not gonna achieve anything. So again, I think the study is destined to fail. And no, we were never contacted about this study, but we have written a press statement in which we basically questioning the ethics of the study at multiple levels. And it's a really good question. And so people would be surprised that you would actually design a study which would be set to fail. I would consider that unethical and immoral. But as we know, most of the vitamin C randomized studies were actually designed to fail. Got it. And uh, if I can also add that the Malaysian study that has said to use ivermectin in ICU patients or in uh, critical patients is also in a similar way going to be less efficacious, although ivermectin is seen to be effective there as well. However, the role of ivermectin as a prophylactic and in the acute early part of the disease is much more important than somebody who is on, on near ventilator or in ICU. So these yeah. studies, I don't know where do they come up. So uh, Dr. Marek, there is one thing that uh, kind of uh, bothers me every time. When I look at such studies, I feel that this is, just like you said, immoral. I feel that there is a corruption in thinking, but at the same time, I fail to understand why would somebody do that? Is this just the money that they're after? So it defies any kind of logic because clearly these these must be somewhat um, informed people. So why we you would design such a study is is unfathomable. You know we would hope that nefarious interests haven't influenced them, and they haven't they're not you know bowing down to the you know pharmaceutical masters. But you know we don't know. You know as as your you know, this cool bean makes himself as has pointed out. It makes absolutely no sense. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Ma makes sense, meaning thank you for your comment. Um, so Fawzi Sultan says, Dr. Marek's opinion about fluvoxamine and antihistamines for treatment of COVID, which antihistamines and when to start? Yes. So that's a more difficult question to answer. So, you know, I think fluvoxamine is an interesting drug because it, um, it's, it's both an SSRI, but it has potent anti-inflammatory properties 
and it also is an anti-serotonin drug, so it would decrease release of serotonin. So we do recommend it in the patient who is at home, is, who's, who's more sick, you know, doesn't have as more severe illness. We do recommend it in hospitalized patients because I think it has a role. So there is good data that flavoxamine does alter the natural history of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So it does make sense to use it. In terms, of, in terms of antihistamines, we don't know. That is, you know, we don't know. There was originally, you know, a few months ago, maybe six months, pretty much excitement on the use of famotidine, which is H, his H2 histamine blocker. However, with time, the data really hasn't panned out as strongly as it initially did. So the role of H2 blockers is unclear. And similarly, the role of H1 blockers in acute COVID, you know, is unclear. You know, what we want to do is give the most bang for the buck, use those drugs which we think are most likely to have an impact, because um, clearly you could add drugs infinitum. So we did not include H1 blockers in the acute treatment. However, as we said, it may have a role in the post-COVID syndrome. Got it. Thank you very much. A couple of comments. Robin says, I've been fanboying Dr. Maddox since March 2020. So am I. And then Ellen says, you're into loan. Uh, Fatless says, what would be a good research setup for the next pandemic so that efficient treatment could be found quickly and data would be reliable? Yeah, that's a good question. I think this pandemic has been a complete failure and we should learn from the enormous mistakes of this pandemic. There was a global lack of collaboration and working together amongst healthcare providers across the world. And there wasn't a unified approach. There wasn't honesty, there wasn't openness. So I think this, this pandemic has been an example of what not to do. I think everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I think this should be an example of next time not what to do. Got it. Thank you. Uh, William Goff, personal question. Ignore if too personal. Did Dr. Marek take a vaccine? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think I've answered this before. So I was vaccinated. I got the Pfizer vaccine probably five months ago in January. Um, would I take the vaccine now knowing what I know now? You know, that's a good question. I've thought about it. I probably would. So as you know, I'm in the age group where the risks, I'm over 60. So I'm in that age group that are more likely to die from COVID than, this, than I'm likely to die from the vaccine. So I probably, if I had to choose again, would do it. But I think, you know, it's a personal decision and it has to be a risk stratifier. You have to weigh the risks and the benefits. So I think people over the age of 60 who have comorbidities, and particularly, you know, who work in the healthcare environment are likely to benefit more from the vaccine than from not taking the vaccine. So, so, for, you know, so I have thought about it again, you know, since I have more, we have more information now than before, and probably I would be vaccinated again. So I have a question, hypothetical then. Imagine by some magic, you become 24, but you know all this that you know now with medicine and all the information that you've collected about COVID. And now you're 24. Will you take would, a vaccine? I would not be vaccinated, no. Thank you. Uh, Jody says, Dr. Merrick, you're a superstar. When this pandemic is finished, what will you do next? Treatments for malaria, dengue, identifying future pandemics, Humanity will still need you. Yeah, thank you, Jody. You know, that is a good question. So, you know, as the FLCC, we've asked that question, you know, because obviously at some point COVID would finish. And I think we're going to refocus on sepsis because sepsis still kills millions of people every year. Uh, it's the commonest cause of death in ICU patients. And I think we still have a lot of work to do in sepsis. So, you know, I think that's where we will probably turn our attention. You know, hopefully we never have to deal with a pandemic like this ever again in, in you know, what's, rest of, in what's left of my life. 
uh, and we hope that you have a long, healthy, happy life and keep leading us and being with us. Uh, Nick Ariza, he's a physician as well, says 73% protection from severe COVID with vegan diet, yet never any discussion of this. Why? So, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I'm not an expert on, you know, the question that he asks. But clearly, you know, we need to look at the whole patient and diet is really important. And I think, you know, it's a factor that's been missing. We know vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc are all important. Um, so, you know, a, a, a diet, you know, a vegetable based diet really is high in omega fatty acids. That may be the reason, you know, humans evolved on a diet which was much higher in omega threes than omega sixes. So a plant based diet with high um, omega threes may be beneficial, but clearly, you know, we know why people don't have an interest in doing such research. So, you know, I would say, yes, let just bring it all on. Makes sense. Thank you very much. So a few more questions. I'm going to try to make them fast. So I know I'm aware of the time and I'm so sorry. And I'm, I'm grateful as well for your time. KB says, if you take ivermectin prophylactically, will it injure the liver over time? Yeah, so this is a falsehood. This is a falsehood perpetuated by the FDA. The FDA's website maintains that ivermectin is hepatotoxic. That is completely and utterly false with a big F, with a big Thank F. So we know we've looked at the literature. There, there have been 3.7 billion doses. That's a B of ivermectin administered. We know of one one, possibly two cases of hepatitis may be associated with ivermectin. So that's part of the big lie. Got it. Thank you very much. And talking about billions, uh, Dr. Merrick, you might be uh, happy to hear this. In the last 14, 15 months that we've been talking about COVID, there has been quarter billion minutes watched for COVID on this channel. And the majority of the time, is or a, a large time is your talks <laughs> wow thank you and thank you actually so emmer o sayoshiro says is the delta variant more or less lethal than the wild or alpha variants so that's a good question so from the data we know the delta variant is due to a mutation near the furin site so this makes the virus much more virulent so it's more contagious, it replicates to much higher levels, it's more infectious, it results in more severe disease, it results in more serious hospitalizations and in deaths. So yes, this is a more lethal variant. Got it. One more question. I think that this question is going to trip you up. Dr. Eric Osgood says, which recording artist recorded the best graduation pop song of all times? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have to pass or take a 50 50. I, I don't know. <laughs> See, I knew it. All right. So, uh, KB says Dr. Marek vaccinated. So, you just answered that question. Um, Alan says, following up on, on with your discussion with Dr. Patterson, how is, how is he treating long COVID, specifically long COVID, last, long lasting myocarditis? Yes, yeah, so I'm not specifically aware what Dr. Patterson does. I know he uses, you know, monocyte CCR5 blockers. He uses statins. I'm not sure if he, you know, if he has a specific approach to myocarditis, but clearly I think if you have post vaccination or post COVID myocarditis or pericarditis would make sense to use colchicine. Got it. Uh, David Scully says, if you follow the FLCCC prophylaxis protocol, will your zinc level go too high? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we actually have decreased the zinc level to some degree because it seems like zinc and copper compete with each other for transport across the gut. So if you use high doses of zinc for a prolonged period of time, it can cause copper deficiency. So that's why we've decreased the dosing of zinc. But it's important to look at whether this is elemental zinc or this is zinc sulfate or zinc gluconate. 
So we recommend a dose of 30 to 40 milligrams per day. Um, and that's really should be a safe level and should not interfere with copper transport. But that's elemental zinc. So it's important people look on the, you know, the uh, components on the bottle to see how much is elemental zinc. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, so Tiago Silva says, can one using avamectin always in prophylaxis and being two years of more without infections, SARS-CoV-2 influenza become with a lazy and therefore weaker immune system? So will continuous use of ivermectin make immune system weak because viruses are not attacking us anymore? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I think the answer would be no. We know of no evidence of that. It just so happens that ivermectin is likely effective against influenza. It's also active against herpes virus. So there's no, there's no data that having a less severe infection will cause a weaker immune system. Got it. Thank you. The next question you have already talked about, this is about ivermectin. I'm going to leave that there. There are lots of questions on YouTube as well, as you can see here. For example, what are the potential negative side effects of ivermectin? We talked about it. The mRNA vaccines for cat coronavirus experiment ended with all vaccines. Cats died. So there is a question out there that animals died with the vaccine. And so the question is, will humans die with the vaccines too? Yeah, so there was a particular side effect which happened with the earlier vaccines called immune enhancement. So what happened when people were vaccinated, they develop an immune response. When they were then exposed to the coronavirus, they developed paradoxically a heightened immune response because the antibodies weren't totally neutralizing and develop what's called immune enhancement. As far as we know, this concept of immune enhancement has not happened with these vaccines. Um, they do cause other problems, but um, as far as I know, there are no reported cases of antibody dependent immune enhancement following vaccination in humans that we're aware of. And, and you're correct. And they actually tried to do a study in which they took human cells and the other cells and they tried to see if they could produce in, in a lab the ADE kind of a, uh, outcome. And they saw that it did happen in chicken cells, but not in human cells. Um, so the Bayless says, is there a connection between monocytes and mast cells? Do they trigger each other? Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So, you know, all the cells communicate with each other. Mast cells communicate with, mast cells communicate with monocytes and macrophages in a really complex manner. So yes, mast cells do activate monocytes and monocytes activate mast cells. So there is this dual talking between them. How important mast cells are is somewhat unresolved. We know categorically definitively that monocytes and macrophages are central to the pathophysiology of COVID. The role of mast cells is somewhat unclear but clearly there is interaction between macrophages, monocytes, and mast cells. So a couple of more questions. I know that we have now had you for, for one and a half hour. Uh, one question, this is very commonly asked, would regular taking of ivermectin as prophylaxis destroy your gut flora? So that's a good question. And my answer would be no, not that we know of, because as far as I know, ivermectin does not have antibacterial effects that I'm aware of. So it, it destroys parasites and it kills viruses. So I, my gut feeling, being a gut feeling, um, I would say probably no. Got it. One more question. Juliet says, is viral shedding a thing called the bystander effect? Should the non-vaxxed take precaution around recently vaxxed spouses? So this question about whether people who've been vaccinated can somehow influence physiologically bystanders is somewhat of a fantastical question. Um, we have no evidence that it actually happens. The, the, the theory is that people who vaccinated may have circulating spike protein. 
The spike protein may then form pseudovirons. These pseudovirons may then go to the lung, and then people may exhale pseudovirons or can be transmitted sexually and therefore can influence people near them. So this is a fantastical theory. You know, I think that an alien invasion is probably more likely than... <laughs> But, you know, anything's possible. You know, I think you have to have an open mind. When I first heard of this, I thought this is completely too fantastical. But then I heard about the proposed mechanism, which doesn't seem too far-fetched. So I think we need to keep an open mind. I think at this point, there really is not a lot of evidence that people who've been vaccinated can somehow spread spike protein to people in close contact. Got it. Uh, I said that was the last two more questions. David Wilner says, could there be inhibited viral RNA or mRNA in monocytes upon expressing ACE2 in certain conditions, S1 toxin detection, S1 factories, Pandora's boxes until differentiating into macrophages? So what seems to happen is the monocyte obviously gets infected um, uh, the virus replicates, we get production of spike protein. It seems that the viral replication or the virus is inactivated. The viral, whether viral RNA still stays, we're not sure, but it seems that the spike protein is pretty persistent. So, you know, you know it, that what happens in both macrophages and monocytes is that the spike protein remains, and it's profoundly immunogenic. It stimulates the inflammatory response. And it's an interesting question why the uh, adaptive and immune response does not kill off these cells harboring spike protein. And I think that's part of the problem with COVID, is we have abnormalities in T cells and natural killer cells, cytotoxic cells, much like in HLH, they cannot normally kill monocytes because normally monocytes circulate just for a day or two and then die. So the question is, why do we have these long-lived monocytes? And presumably it's because of a failure of the immune system to get rid of these cells. Got it. Thank you very much. Last question. Kara Lady Bean says, Dr. Marek mentioned statins in I recover. Would niacin B3 be a suitable substitute? <laughs> yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So, you know, statins are very effective drugs. We know, despite what people say, they're very effective for people with heart disease. And it probably has less to do with lowering your lipids than it has to do with its anti-inflammatory effects on the macrophage. So atheromatous plaques are due to macrophages. And if you take a statin, you reprogram your macrophage. So we know that statins are very effective in preventing plaque development and atheromatous growth. So statins are very effective drugs, both in anti-inflammatory and in reprogramming the, the macrophage. So I think they have a really important role. You know, whether niacin and B3 and, um, and then acetylcysteine and these other antioxidants have a role you know, we don't know, and possibly as an adjunctive agent, but I think, you know, statins are, by and large, very safe drugs. Um, they're pretty cheap these days, and I think is, you know, fortuitously have been shown to be pretty effective. Got it. Thank you very much for your time, a lot of your time, for your patience to answer all those questions on Twitter and on YouTube and on live, and then discussing all those rumors and myths as well. Thank you so much for leading uh, FLCCC as uh, well. And thank you for leading us through this pandemic. And thank you for what all you doing, because I think you have provided a really important portal for people to express their points of view. And, you know, I might not, not agree with all of them, but that's fine. I think people need to, we need to have dialogue. And I thank you for providing the window or the portal for people to do that. And you've done a really great thing for, for mankind. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you very much for everything that you're doing and hope to have you with us soon and hope the pandemic is over and we are talking about sepsis and other things. 
that's a plan. I think we'll meet when the when the pandemic is over, hopefully soon, and we can talk about some new stuff. Perfect. Thank you very much. And Cool Beans, thank you very much for your time, for sticking around during this discussion and for asking those valuable questions that are good information for others as well. I would see you this evening with Steve Kirsch. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.